studied the topic of hell, having had no interest in it. But this was a vision. This, uh, you know, it was not a near-death experience. It was an out-of-body experience that would be classified as a vision. Right. In 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2, Paul, when he was caught up into heaven in a vision, he said whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Yeah. Well, the Lord showed me that I left my body. I've never had a vision before. I've never asked for one. I've, like I said, mm -hmm. I'm not interested in hell in any way. My wife and I have never gone to dark movies. Right. I've never taken drugs or drank, nothing like that. Uh, but uh, we went to a prayer meeting yeah. and came home, and I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and suddenly I was pulled out of my body. Wow. Now, the Bible talks about visions. It talks about trances. Peter had a trance. Right. Uh, it talks about visions where visions can be where you're watching an event in front of you as if it's on a screen. I told you earlier, I've had that type of a vision. I also know that scripture, just like you shared this morning, you gave us numerous examples. Scripture talks about, like Paul, like John, they were caught up out of their body as if they're their soul, their spirit went with the Lord and started to see things that they did not see in the flesh, but they were caught up in that vision. That's what you experienced. Right. And you can actually travel like they, they did to heaven. Yeah. And I explained Ezekiel in chapter 8. He was picked up by his hair and he was carried to Jerusalem. He actually went to Jerusalem in a vision. Right. And so you can experience the same things in your spirit body that you would in your physical body. Right. And it's just as real. Well, you, you have a, a live audience here. Um, you wouldn't want a dead audience. These guys are very much alive. Did you hear them doing praise and worship earlier? It was awesome. It, they, they were electric. It was really good. Well, but before we get into any of the details, and then we're going to cover material that hasn't been covered this morning, look them in the eye. As you look at them, and I want you to tell them straight up, no holds a bar, why they don't want to go to hell. Where do I start? There's a lot of reasons. You know, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. He never intended for, God to go, for man to go to this horrible place. But God gives man a choice. And I can tell you, if any of us could see hell for just five seconds, it would change your life. It's the most horrifying place, far worse than your mind can even conceive. And you do not want to take a chance because this place is eternal and you'll never get out. But the worst part of hell is that you are hopeless. You understand you're not getting out. I mean, this pain and suffering that you will go through in hell, there is no one to come deliver you, no one to rescue you. You're not getting out, and you understand that. And to be hopeless is really, truly horrific. None of us here have ever really experienced true hopelessness because we can always die to get out of our situation. But in hell, you understand you're not getting out. Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And to be separated from God, you're separated from all good for all eternity. You see, everything we enjoy in life that's good comes from God. James 1, 17 says that every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. Well, in hell, you are separated from God, separated from all good. And so you don't experience any good thing apart from God. You don't want to take a chance at all with your soul because your soul is eternal. So every horrific event that has ever taken place in mankind, every horrific newsreel story combined doesn't come close to what you experience. I mean, honestly, here on earth, horror stories that you hear, real things that have happened to people doesn't come close to what you experience for 23 minutes. No, no. You know, and we can all relate to burning. Right? There's not much worse than burning. Well, you are literally burning and on fire and in that kind of agony for all eternity. That's just one thing to experience. That enough would be, that alone would be far sure. more than enough. But you're in absolute darkness. It's terrible to just be in the dark. Right. Uh, you're apart from people. You never get to be with a person again. You have never have one conversation again. You don't ever see your loved ones. They will never even know where you're at. You are starving, hungry, you're thirsty. Just a drop of water would be precious. You do anything for a drop of water. Uh, you hear screams of people, millions of people screaming, and it's deafening to hear that kind of screams. Sure. And uh, you want to get away from it, but you can't. You never get to go to sleep again. You have to endure the feeling of no sleep for all eternity, exhaustion. You have no physical strength in your body. You ever had the flu and you felt weak? 
It's a yeah. thousand times worse. Any movement takes tremendous effort. The stench is so foul, it's sickening to smell the odors of hell. Uh, I could go on and on, but just any one of these things, Pastor, would be too much to endure, but yet you have to endure all of them. Now, you, were, you, were going to, you had gone to a prayer meeting that night. Correct. You come home together with Annette. Yes. And uh, I believe at 3 o'clock in the morning. Correct. You wake up, you go to get a drink of water. Right. If you knew what you were going to encounter, you would have taken a gallon of water, right? <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, I had no idea. I had no idea this would happen. Now, 23 minutes later, and you know it's 23 minutes later, because you talked about it afterwards, you hear your husband's, husband screaming hysterically from another part of the house. Is that right? Yes. What, before you even found them, what went through your head? What were you thinking? Well, I heard the screams, and that's what woke me up. And then I looked at our digital clock, which read 323. So I went down the hallway, and the first thought is, he's dying. I need to call 911, emergency services. But when he began to cry out and scream, pray for me, pray for me, the Lord has taken me to hell, that's when I, I realized, okay, something spiritual has happened here. And I actually felt a relief or a peace, and I know that was from God, because right. I knew at that point he was not physically dying. Okay. And so how did you see him? What, what was he doing? Was he writhing on the floor? Was he, what, he, what was going on? He was in a fetal position, like you would be with your hands to your temple. Yeah. And he was in a fetal position, screaming in terror and torment. And anyone who knows Bill knows his nature is completely opposite. Bill is very calm, conservative. He's never been one to be overly emotional or anything like that. So I knew this is completely out of his character and out of his nature. And it's, it's serious. I mean, it, he was in torment. Right. So... So she prayed for me, yeah. and when I screamed out, pray for me, pray for me, the Lord's taking me to hell. When she prayed, the Lord removed the horror from my mind. He separated the two. The, he left the memory of hell, but took out the horror. Hard to explain that, but you know, it's, uh, the Bible says that he's able to divide both soul and spirit. Mm -hmm. So he can do that, and of course, we know God can do anything. But he removed that horror, but left the memory so I could uh, recall the story and so forth. Tell us briefly... Uh, you go to get a drink, obviously you sat down on a couch or something, or did you just drop to the floor? And then what happens from that point? What did you start to see? What were the first encounters you had? I was walking towards the kitchen, and on my way to the kitchen, I was just taken out of my body, and my body just fell to the floor. And I found myself falling through the air down this long tunnel, and it was getting hotter and hotter. And I entered this open cavern area, and I landed on an actual stone floor in hell. Rough-hewn stone walls, bars. I was actually in a prison cell, but it was more like a dungeon. Filthy, stinking, dirty prison cell. Right. And I had no idea how I got there, why I was there. There was no explanation until the return. The Lord right. explained on the way back. But I was fully awake and cognizant, just like I'm sitting here now. I wonder, how did I get here? Why am I here? But, you know, that's where I first noticed myself in the prison cell, and the heat was so far beyond the ability to sustain life. I, I wonder how could I be alive in this heat. I'm not here to convince anyone to believe my experience. I understand why a lot of people would be skeptical. Yeah. I would be also. But I just try to point them to the Scripture. You know, that's the only thing that really matters is for people to really believe the Scripture is true and avoid hell just the same. You know what, what amazed me, church, today as he was sharing... Uh, scripture and talking about how literally what that scripture says you experience the literalness of that word and I had brought this up in one of our previous miracles happens shows we've interviewed quite a few folk who have died uh, had a few moments in hell uh, fortunately for them they had more time in heaven okay but one of the things that keeps coming out over and over and over again is that the Word of God is extremely literal. That if it's written there, all the people yeah. I've interviewed, that they start to describe how real that is and how it is literal to a T. 
And that was your experience. Exactly. And I had seven years to study this before the book came out. I started studying because I wanted to know, you know, if everything I saw in hell, if it was really from the Lord, then it's got to be in the Bible. Right. And so I researched, I studied everything to do with hell and listened to CDs and tapes from and other people. This and is so after your experience. After. Right. I never studied it before. But then I found all these verses that have to do, I never studied the topic of right. hell and found so many, like you said, that are so literal describing prison cells and no strength and stench and darkness and so forth. Yeah. And uh, that's what, again, is important for people to believe. Right. The scripture. Now, you saw a lake of fire? I saw a pit of fire. Okay. I didn't saw the lake of fire because that's the future hell, uh, okay. the Gehenna, that no one's in yet. That's uh -huh. after Judgment Day, but that, I saw a pit of fire. That takes place in Revelation. Right. Yeah. In Revelation 2015 and so forth. But right now the current hell I believe that the scriptures real clear is down deep in the earth mm -hmm. there's 49 scriptures that identify where it's at down deep in the earth and I saw prison cells and in a large raging pit of fire and people were actually in the pit in the pit burning now, thousands you, of people you said this morning that there were some demons that were there purposely to keep pushing people back into the fire right now, people, I mean, that alone has got to be torturous. I mean, the thought of that. Here you are desperately trying to escape, get out of the flames, even though you would be in the vicinity and it would be screaming hot. Here are demons constantly just plunging them as if they're baptizing them in the fire. Right. But, you know, you don't even have any strength really to get out. So uh, I honestly don't, without the demons, you couldn't get out anyway. You physically have no physical strength to pull yourself out. But they were just shoved, they were just there to torment people right. and shove them back in and so forth. But uh, it's the most awful sight to see a person burning. Yeah. Most of us have never seen that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's terrible to see an a person actually on fire. You want to help someone, but you can't. You can't help yourself. Right. You know, but the Lord showed me afterwards, you know, I thought there I wanted to help people and I couldn't. But the Lord said, well, you can help them now. You can help people now from not going there. And really, that's how this ministry has come about. You, you had no intention to go into the ministry. None. For, for those who were not here this morning, both you and Annette had very successful careers. Correct. You I had my own real estate company. I was a real estate broker. A broker. And we, she worked for a builder developer. And okay. we were both making over half a million dollars a year. So we had a good income, nice life, everything going wonderful. Uh, we didn't need this. You didn't need help. No, and I, I didn't want to go and speak on it. Right. I literally, I was asked by my a close friend, would he come to, would I come to his Bible study? I told him no for three months. He Finally, wanted you to share the story. Right. And I put Why him didn't off. you want to share it? Well, several reasons. Number one, besides people thinking that you're crazy, you know, I thought, you know, people are going to think I'm nuts, you know. I don't need that. Right. I was a conservative person. Enough people already thought you were nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe being in real estate, you got to be a little bit nuts, but, uh, but really, you know, I, I didn't need the ridicule. Right. But more important than that was, hell is so severe, I knew that there was no way I could put it in words to describe to people how bad it really is. Right. So it's almost futile to try. So I thought, Lord, I don't even want to try. Plus, the time I got to spend with the Lord, the short time with Him, was really precious to me, Pastor. I really valued that time with Him. And I didn't need people to ridicule my experience. I, I just wanted to enjoy. I said, you know, Lord, I got to be with you, alongside you for just a little bit. Now, that was right after He pulled you out of hell. Right. Family. Right. Okay. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to enjoy that and thank God that I got to spend that time with Him. So I didn't need to share this with anybody. But it gave me motivation more than I had already to witness. I thought, great, I'll go and share the gospel even more than I was already. Right. But I didn't want to tell them about my experience. Because but, if they ridiculed the whole thing, even your time with Jesus would come under that shroud right. of skepticism. Now, obviously hell was horrific. And you've dedicated your life. This is how it's unfolded. You didn't foresee this. You didn't plan it. You didn't try to make this happen. Right. You've dedicated your life to telling people around the world what hell is like. First-hand experience. I want to take a moment. I want to hear a little bit more what happened when Jesus came, pulled you out of there. You said those moments were so precious. Tell us. Tell the congregation. What did you see? What did you experience? Well, when I was in this darkness, 
absolutely terrified. Suddenly this bright light appeared. Now I didn't see his face, I just saw the outline of a man standing in this bright, pure, holy light. And it was a light like I've never seen before. Pure and holy, it's just hard to describe. It was so bright, but yet I could still see. It didn't hurt my eyes. I gotta stop you. How many of you were here when we had Ian McCormack? Anybody remember? See, what I love is the similarities that I hear over and over again. Because Ian sat here saying, you know, Pastor Rob, it was the most incredible, brilliant, pure light. And yet, it didn't hurt you exactly. to look at it. That's true. Said the same thing. There was wow. a lot of things in your story that I've heard from right. other people's story. So go on, tell right. us. Isn't that great to hear? Yeah. Awesome. But you know, Pastor, at first when he showed up, you know, and at first I just said, Jesus. And he said, I am. And when he said, I am, I went out. I, I don't know literally if I died. I don't know what happened. I can only explain it through Revelation 1.16 when John saw him and he said his countenance was bright as the sun and I fell at his feet as one dead. But he touched me and I came to and I, like I shared this morning, I was so grateful that I was a Christian that I understood that if he wouldn't have gone to the cross, I would be in that place for all right. eternity. I was so thankful for the cross that the yeah. King of Kings would give his life for me awesome. to keep me out of hell. And, but anyway, at first though, Pastor, I, I felt uh, dirty because in the presence of God, I don't care how clean you are, you will feel filthy in His presence because God is so pure. But He didn't want me to feel uncomfortable, so He removed that feeling I had. You remember Peter when he said, Lord, depart from me, I'm a wicked man. Yeah. Yes. So you just, when you're in his presence, you will feel that. But he took that away, that feeling. And then at that moment, I felt such a peace and a love from him that was so overwhelming. Yeah. I never wanted to be away from it. And I felt like I'm at home. This is where I belong. And the, the love he has for each one of us is so overwhelming. I'm going to tell you, you're going to like heaven. You're going to like heaven. Uh, he, there's a love that we have not experienced here on the earth. Sure. It's just... It's more than words can ever describe, yeah. and that peace that comes over you. And also, when I was with him, the feeling of time, the pressure of time lifted. You know how we're here, we're always in a rush. You're always thinking about time. Got to get it done. Got to get it done. In, in heaven, or I wasn't in heaven, but just in his presence, when you're in eternity, that pressure of time leaves. Amazing. And it's amazing feeling yeah. just to be released from that. It's like it's taken off our shoulders. I know uh, my buddy Ian, and you haven't met him yet. No. But you've, your stories have crossed, and you're probably going to be crossing paths. Well, we are so speaking just a few weeks together. In a couple of weeks, you'll be with Ian. In Give December. Him my, oh, in December. I'm December. sorry. December. Yeah. Give him my regards. But, you know, Ian was a, a drug-taking, drug-selling hippie traveling the world. And... Right after he dies, comes back to life, they finally, you know, the hospital's absolutely amazed with this guy. He was dead. He, now he's alive. He's released a couple of days later. He gets hold of a Bible, and he starts reading where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And he freaks out. He goes, he really is. He really is. Light. And here you're seeing this brilliant light. I think of in Revelations where it says when the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven comes to earth and God recreates this vast planet it'll be paradise and the Bible says there'll be no sun and no moon because the splendor and the glory of God will light the whole earth and first John 1 5 said God is light yeah so he, that so he literal everything about literal. the Word of God is literal Fantastic. Just like when I said I couldn't move in hell, you know, you're, you know all those scriptures about no strength. Yeah. But remember uh, Acts 17, 28, in him we live and move and have, have our, being. our being. Even movement. You, you read over that glibly and think, oh, that's nice. But no, even movement comes from God. So we take for granted here on earth, you know, we're, we're doing uh, soccer, we're playing football, whatever. We're going to work, walking to work. Our very ability to move and have life and strength 
is at God's permission. It's the breath of his life in us. That's right. And in hell, it's taken away. Exactly. And you know, like I mentioned this morning, that when a demon tore my flesh open, and I noticed there was no blood or water. Right. But see, Leviticus 17.11 says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Yeah. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. It's, it's literal. Yeah. You know, in Zechariah 9.11, thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There is no water in hell, just like the Bible says, exactly. It's not metaphorical. I, I got to ask you, just came to my head, and Jesus talks about the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Gnashing, I, I imagine teeth just grinding, people being under such intense stress. And did you experience that? Did you see that? What did you notice with people that were there? I, I saw people through that big pit of fire, and they were burning and screaming. The screams were so loud like the weeping and gnashing of teeth, but it is, it's so loud to hear a person in agony, but thousands of people screaming all at the same time. Yeah. It's the most awful sight, just like he said, weeping and gnashing of teeth. I think partially it's people, besides the pain they're enduring, it's also their thought of, I had a chance to be saved. I had thousands of opportunities. And they would think back in their mind all the times they had to get saved, but they rejected the truth. Over and right. over. It's their own fault. Like Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, your own words will condemn you. It's our own words when people say, I don't believe the Bible. And they'll replay that in their mind. What, what was one of the most convincing things that assured you this wasn't a dream, this wasn't a nightmare, okay? What was it as you came back from there, how did you know that you know that you know this wasn't a dream? You were there, you experienced this. Well, besides how upset I was over this, after she prayed for me, even when the Lord removed the horror, it took me about a year to settle down from this, number one. Wow. Not that I was, had bad dreams, no nightmares. I just had such a passion for the lost right. that I wanted to grab everybody, honestly, by the shirt collar. Right. And that said, I don't believe in Jesus. I wanted to just throw them down on the ground and say, you got to get saved. Yeah. You can't go to hell. You have to understand. Yeah. That's how I felt. And it's frustrating to have that feeling when people say, I don't believe this Bible stuff. Right. Because you love people. You want to see them go to heaven and for them to reject the truth. But after time, the Lord shared with me that, Bill, you know, you're not the Savior. You're just the messenger boy. And right. so I had to calm down from that. But also the second thing is it caused my wife and I to leave our careers you know, and, and like I said, we made a lot of money. It was not an easy decision to walk away. Right. I worked 35 years to build up a clientele in the business. And I finally had it to where I didn't have to go out and beat the pavement, so to speak. I had it coming to, to us. Mm -hmm. We were comfortable. We were just married for one year. And so to leave our careers and to walk away from that income, we didn't know how we were going to make a living. Right. And to be a first-time author... Well, how do, who's going to buy my book? Sure. You know? We weren't in it for the money. And, the, and the, uh, the people that, you know, the publisher came to us. They asked us to write the book. And I asked them, I said, well, how, ma how many people would buy this book? How, what, what would a book sell for a first-time author? He said, maybe 3,000 copies, maybe 6,000 if it goes just crazy. If it just <coughs> goes over the top, maybe 25,000. Well, that's not enough to even pay the bills at all. Right. So, it, you know, but, but the Lord spoke to us and said, Trust me, just because we had so many invitations to go speak, we didn't look for any of them. We have never looked for one. We don't invite ourselves, we get invited. So, but we had so many that we had to decide, well, what do we do? Do we keep working or do we fulfill the invitations? Mm -hmm. We felt like God said, trust me and just let go of your jobs and go and I'll take care of and you. And just out of curiosity, how many books have sold so far? Uh, probably about a million and a half. A million and a half. So that's only God. It's only God. Praise God. And, you know, Pastor, it, it's not even endorsed by anybody. You know, I didn't know anybody. I was a realtor. What, are you going to have a real estate person endorse it? You know, it didn't matter. So it was only because it's to do with souls. Right. You know, when your heart is for souls, God will make a way. And uh, he has done that ever since. He's provided for us and yeah. continues to You know, endorse. Bill, I, I had struggled as a young kid with a spirit of fear. I had to be delivered from a spirit of fear. It used to torment me. And, and so I've had some pretty graphic, scary nightmares. But even when you wait, you know, you're shook for, you know, a minute or two, but you realize, oh, that was a dream. Right. And you shake it off. 
You didn't shake this off. No, that was the other reason. See, like you said, a dream, even a terrible nightmare, you can shake it off, might last even a week. Right. But th this will never go away. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget the screams of the people. And so that has stayed with me. It's caused me to leave my career and change our lives and just go out there and do what God's called us to do. And Matt, you saw your body lying on the floor when you right. came back. Right, that's what I was doing. So it wasn't just a dream. You saw I saw your body. my body. Now you were able to look through the house? I could see right through the roof. It was the oddest thing. You could just see right through, like there was no roof there. See, folks, now again, I mix with a lot of folk who have had experiences like this. And in the spirit world, you can see within this room, you can see beyond. Uh, Tamara Leroux, who was here last week, she spoke about how while she was experiencing hell, she could look beyond and see heaven. And uh, in the spirit world, there's no limit to sight. And so you could see this dimension and then at will see into another dimension and another dimension yet again. Right. So you saw through the house, you saw your body on the floor, just like we hear stories of people who are dying on an operating table right. and they're above their body, they see everything going on. Exactly. And it was so odd to be out of your body. I looked at it like, that's not me. This is the real me. Yeah. The spirit man is the real you because it lasts yeah. eternally. You said it felt like your car. Like right. Like I got out of a vehicle. Right. Like if right. you were to get out of your car, it's a vehicle to get you around in life, but it's not you. Right. That's how the body looks so temporal. And, uh, so Amazing. It gives you a very different perspective. Now, we were talking earlier, and, uh, you know, I appreciated the... Uh, the candidness, uh, you had made a comment the next day, I believe it was pretty much 24 hours later, mm -hmm. you're going to somebody's house. Right. You're sitting in the car. What, tell, tell the folk here what you told me. Well, the next day, you know, it's so surreal that the night before you think, I actually been to hell. I mean, even though I knew I was there, I was praying on the way. I was going back to the home that we were at the night before where we had the prayer meeting. Right. at the pastor's house and he was doing a refi so I was getting some paper signed so on the way I was praying I said Lord I know I've been there but can you confirm this I just want some confirmation this is just so bizarre the next day when you're in the light and you know it's all normal again um, and I said Lord if I was really there give me a glimpse of it just give me a quick glimpse of it I know it seems crazy to ask for that now but uh -huh. uh, Anyway, I pulled up in, at, in front of his car, put it in park, and then suddenly I was pulled out of my body again, and I found myself falling through this tunnel, this time a lot faster, traveling down this tunnel. I ended up before this big pit. I saw people screaming and burning. This time I was there as only an observer, not as a participant, but I was only there 10 seconds, and I was pulled back up this tunnel, ended up back in my car, and just seeing it for 10 seconds... I was so shook up, Pastor, I couldn't even move. I was soaked. I was shaking. You were covered in sweat. Just you covered in sweat. And I was in a suit in just 10 seconds. And I couldn't move. And then the person I was going to see, he was on the cell phone. He was motioning to me to come in the house. He came to the front door. And I couldn't get out of the car. I sat there for 20 minutes just frozen. And I said, Lord, I don't want to ever see that place again, ever. It, it, it took a second time? Well, it just confirmed it. No. Confirmed. See, no. because if it was me, after the first time, I would have said, you know, God, I want to know that this is real. Can I go to heaven and see my mansion? <laughs> exactly. I know, that doesn't seem, I should have asked him for heaven. Right? Show me an angel. <laughs> I must have been a little out of my mind. You know, I've, I've seen demons on several occasions. Okay, so I didn't go to hell. But I see. saw demons and I would be frozen, couldn't move. All I can do is think. I've never said, now God, um, you know, I'm not sure if that was real. Let me see it again. I say, hey God, how about an angel next time? Right, right. <laughs> I know, I must need a little help, Pastor. But so just pray for me. <laughs> It affected you more than you realize, maybe. Right. But what I found interesting about this was that here you are, a professional businessman. You go into the house. Here's this pastor. He notices something is very wrong with you. He sees you're shaken 
tell them because I thought that was interesting because it really proves what a rattling effect. This is broad daylight. Here you are. You asked for a 10. Well, you didn't ask for a 10 second plunge, but you get a 10 second plunge in a right. hell and a pastor is noticing what about you? Well, he noticed I was extremely shaken. I didn't want to tell him. I didn't want to tell anybody. And he just said, Bill, what's wrong with you? I just said, it's nothing. Just, just sign these papers. He says, okay. And he signed them and, I, and he says, Bill, come on. Something's wrong with you. Tell me what's going on. I said, nothing, Pastor. I just, I got to go. I just walked out. So he knew something was odd, something was wrong. But I just, in my mind, I didn't want to share it with anybody. I thought, I am not telling anybody about this experience. I mean, he could have thought you were trying to scam him on the refinance. You're <laughs> yeah. acting really weird, stuff like that. But you were so shook up. He was up. a very good friend. Yeah, he was very a good friend. friend. But you were so shook up, you couldn't right. bring yourself to talk right. about what you even experienced now for 10 seconds. Right. And you know, Pastor, I had so many confirmations after this, though, that the Lord gave me, just to confirm. We were invited to a church, uh, the largest Russian church in America, in Sacramento. And uh, there was like 5,000 people showed up, and I spoke, and it was all, they had to have an interpreter, Russian. And at the end, one of the elders that was sitting up on the stage comes shuffling up. He was old, you know, maybe 90 years old. And uh, he just shuffled up, and he raised his cane up, and he said to the people in Russian, I didn't know what he said, but he said, this is the man I've been praying for. And the whole place went crazy. Well, I didn't know what that meant. Well, it turned out he was a Russian Jew, and he was in Auschwitz. He was thrown into, uh, he was in uh, the camp Auschwitz in the World War II and thrown into the ovens. And he died. And someone found him and resuscitated him, pulled him out of the ovens and resuscitated wow. him. Well, he was a Russian Jew. He went to hell. And he wrote a book about what he saw in hell. Wow. And he prayed ever since the 40s, God, would you send someone by to verify what I saw? And he'd been praying that for well, 60 years. I'm really glad you got 60 the years. 60, 60 years. 60 years he prayed. Praying that. So now God fulfilled his promise. And it, he was weeping. And that was so humbling to me to think I was an answer to this man's prayer that went through such horrible... Just you know, to horrible, confirm right. the awfulness of hell. Right. Yeah. And you know, Pastor, I've met a lot of people over the years now that have written us or I've read their books or I've met them that have had experiences with hell. I'm not the only one. There's other people right. that have had visions or near-death experiences. Some are really legitimate. Mm -hmm. I believe them. One was, uh, I didn't meet, of course, was John Bunyan, who wrote the book Pilgrim's Progress, Pilgrim's Progress. back in the 1600s. Right. Famous, well-known, uh, respected person. Well, he also wrote a book called Visions of Heaven and Hell, where wow. he was actually shown heaven and hell in a really? vision, and he saw the same things I saw, but much more. And he's considered a credible scholar. So he's not just some wild, off-the-wall person. So no. there's many other people that sure. have seen this. Absolutely. We were at a church that was up in the mountains, remote area. And we wondered, Lord, have we, is this the right place? Should we have really gone to this church? It was way out in the middle of nowhere. There wasn't even a hotel or a motel to even stay in. We had to stay in a nursing home right. just to even go speak at this church. And, uh, I mean, and, go but, figure. You know, here's this glamorous preaching ministry. First, your ministry gets baptized by you going to hell. Yeah, Jesus, send me to hell, you know. Then it was, it was such a small town, they didn't have a hotel or motel. So they just put us up in a nursing home. But, um, and uh, it was noisy I'd be laying all night. there thinking, please, Jesus, don't take me to hell again. <laughs> It was a, a trial spending the night there, I have to say. But the next day, you know, we went to the church, and there were so many salvations that came. But one in particular, a young boy came up. He was 20 years old. Now, a year before, somebody gave him our book, and he just glanced at it and threw it in the trash. And um, a year later, he had decided he was going to commit suicide. He had been taking drugs and some other things, and... And he just wanted to commit suicide. Well, he's driving by the church to go commit suicide. And he sees our name on the sign of the church. And he thought, what's the odds in this guy? I remember his book from a year ago. What's the chance of him being out in the middle of nowhere at this church? And he was driving by right before 7, and the service was at 7. So he comes to the service, comes forward, gives his life to the Lord. And at the end, he comes in the back, and I'm trying to meet people. And he just is weeping, and he grabs my hand. And he would not let go for an hour as we were talking to people. He stayed holding my hand for an hour and just said, I was on my way to commit suicide. 
I would have been in hell right now if it wasn't for you coming to this town. Isn't that awesome? And 20, you know. There was um, a situation where there was a guy that was, he was saved, but he was living totally backslidden. He read our book and he got really excited about wanting to serve God. Right. So he got a hold of our CD and he was passing them out to all his friends. And one day he was sitting in Detroit in traffic, stuck in dead traffic. And he felt like the Lord was prompting him to get out of the car and knock on the window in front of him, of the car in front, and give him our CD. While he's in bumper to bumper yeah. traffic. But he in thought, Detroit. But he in thought, Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> but he said to himself, he said, you know, Lord. Are you sure he didn't want to have an experience going to hell? <laughs> <laughs> well, he said to himself, Lord, I mean, this is a bad part of town in Detroit. Yeah, right. They're going to think I'm a freeway strangler or something, you know. So... Um, the Lord kept prompting him, so he finally gets out of the car, knocks on the window, the guy rolls it down, and he says, what do you want? And he says, I just feel like I'm supposed to give you this CD of Bill Weiss. And he said, the guy starts weeping. And he thought, what's wrong? And he says, you don't understand. He says, I was just here in the car praying. I read his book, and I was praying, Lord, my family won't read a book, but they would hear a CD of Bill Weiss. Where do I get a CD of Bill Weiss? Awesome. And... That's it not gets the end. better. It gets better. So he decides uh, to take the CD. Now he gets, you know, he gets uh, the CD, takes it to his family. And this is the guy in the car. The now. guy in the, the car. Guy in the car who yeah. received it. Two years later, he comes to a church that we're speaking at, a couple states away, drove to meet us, brings his whole family of 19 people, and he says, Bill, I took the CD, took my family, they listened to it. All 19 are saved. I want you to meet them. They're all here. And that's fantastic. Yeah! One CD. Come on! But the point is, one person being obedient, yeah. just to hear the prompting of the Holy that's Spirit right. to do it. A 12-year-old girl that really affected us, so many as this has happened to, but one particular 12-year-old came up to us after the service. She was weeping, and she says, Bill, I read your book, and I got saved, but my whole family was not saved, and I, and I heard you were coming to the, my town. 12-year-old. 12-year-old, and she said, I talked my family into coming, and she says, they all went forward. I want you to meet them, and she had her whole family there, and they all got saved, Come but the on. point was, she was only 12, and yeah. she had that kind of heart. And she was weeping at the book table just weeping and crying fantastic. so grateful it's amazing fantastic anyway we could go on with stories so many that That's god has brilliant. done but that is praise god thank you jesus oh, we thank you guys for being obedient oh, oh, thank it's... you for being obedient you could have so easily looked at your money looked at your reputation looked at your comfortable lives you know we've been talking and you know, uh, Bill is a, a C personality in the DISC system. He's, he likes everything organized. He likes routine. He likes all of those things. And everything <laughs> God has called him to in this life now is the opposite of what he is comfortable with. They both hate traveling. I mean, go figure. They hate traveling. All right? They, they are health fanatics. Try feeding them. You know, would you like your carrots boiled, mashed, or... <laughs> no. <laughs> They're great guests. They're easy to take care of. But they are health and that. And they very used to routine. God pulled you out of everything that is normal for you right. to tell a story that people could think you're a nutcase. Exactly. Right? And, Pastor, I never liked public speaking. That was the last thing I wanted to do. So, you know, God will sometimes pull us out of our comfort zones. This was way out of mind, yeah. you know. But if we'll be obedient, you know, then, like I said, it doesn't matter if I feel uncomfortable. When you have a heart for souls and yeah, you see someone come right. to the Lord, yeah. there is nothing greater than seeing a person's eyes open to the truth of the gospel. That's great. It's awesome. You know, they don't have to believe me. Just yeah. believe the gospel and, and avoid hell, you know. My, my greatest reward as a pastor is after people get saved, they've been in the church for a year or two, their marriage has been restored, they've been healed, whatever, and they just absolutely love you and honor you and are so grateful because of the radical transformation in their lives through Jesus Christ. Right. And that, that makes it all worth it, doesn't it? Oh, it does. Yeah, and, I, and we go everywhere together, my wife and I, so that's another blessing that we yeah. get to go and travel. To, I wouldn't go without her. And yeah. So God's really blessed us to be able awesome. to do that. 
We have some questions that have come in, and uh, they're going to start putting them up on the screen for me. And uh, Bill, the very first thing, uh, somebody wrote in, and they wanted to know, were you living for Christ when you were taken through the depths of hell? Yes, I've been a Christian for 42 years. This happened 14 years ago. So okay. I was serving in the church. I was one of the worship leaders. I've always taught in the church as in some form. Um, uh, even though I didn't really want to speak, but the pastors always asked me to, and I love the Word of God. So I've always been a person that is, I love the Word, you know, right. to study the Word and live by it and apply it to your life directly. So I've been a person that loved the Word. I was living for God. This had nothing to do with, you know, living in sin or anything. Yeah. Just a vision, just right. simply a vision. It was a vision. Actually, and, and I know it's not part of that question, but what was very interesting today, God took him to hell without him erased from his mind the awareness of being a born-again Christian. Otherwise, you would have been standing on the word, rebuking those devils. I can imagine what would have happened in hell. If you remembered and knew who you were, you would have been blasting those devils through those flames, rebuking them in Jesus' name. You would have right. had a revival down there. <laughs> <laughs> right, I would have known. I right. praise God, he's getting me out of here. Yes. I don't have, my eternal home is in heaven. I but he known. wanted you to experience right. what an unsaved person experiences so that you could feel what they are feeling right now in hell right. and then share it so that hearers can come and accept Christ. Exactly. If I was there as a Christian, and I would have, I would have known praise God is getting me out of here, but he yeah. wanted me to feel that hopeless feeling and yeah. and that is something pastor that none of us can really even grasp no. here no you can't no. even imagine that this is forever there's not going to be an end ever and that thought alone is so tormenting yeah you know and that's what he wanted me to you know today. after hearing you this morning and all the scriptures that lined up and just really quickly before we get to the next question uh jason was leading songs we we're starting the show they were supposed to do two songs and I was so excited about getting the show started. He finishes the first song, and I'm jumping up on the <laughs> stage, and I hear the drummer going like this here, getting ready for the next song. I thought, dummy. <laughs> and and, and uh, here I was also, and I realized I had jumped my cue. But uh, the point is, as we were singing, I was thinking about how awful hell was, how oppressed, how strengthless, all these demons, creatures, the whole Ball of wax. And here's Jesus, his worst possible day. Whipped 39 times. Beard plucked out. Spear in his side. Rejected. Despised. Broken. In the middle of hell. And he comes out victorious and scared the pants off of every demon. And he took every crown. He put every one of them, starting with Satan himself, under his feet. And I'm getting visions of this here while we're singing choruses. No wonder I jumped on the stage. I'm thinking, man, hell is so hellish. And my Jesus, on his worst day, beat the pants off the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next question. Here we go. In Revelation, it says about the resurrection of the dead. Does that mean that the dead in hell will be given a second chance and the ones that are in heaven, will they remember their loved ones that didn't make it? So let's answer the first part of the question. The Bible talks about the resurrection of the dead. Is that referring to those who are in hell will get a second chance? No. It's referring to, in Revelation 20, 13, it says, death and hell, and it uses the word sheol, so it's the current hell. Mm -hmm. Death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them, and they were all judged. Right. And those whose names were not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. Right. So it's not a second chance. It's just that the hell now is a temporary hell, mm -hmm. and all the dead that are in hell will be delivered up and yeah. then judged at Judgment Day and cast into the lake of fire, which is a, a separate hell, right. the future hell. So it's, there is no second now, chance. Now, the resurrection of the dead. When Lazarus, Mary and Martha's brother, Lazarus died, Jesus said to the ladies, he said, he will live again. He will rise again. Right. And they said, thinking from their religious minds, they said, yes, we know, in the resurrection. 
See, the Bible talks about, Paul says, uh, for me to be absent from my body is to be present with the Lord. If you're a born-again believer, the minute we die, our spirit, our soul goes to be with the Lord. For me to be absent from this body, this vehicle, I am immediately present with the Lord. But the Bible also says when Jesus comes back and Michael, Michael sounds that trumpet, the dead in Christ, everyone who was a born-again believer and over the last couple of thousand years as they their bodies are dead in that ground. Their physical bodies will rise up and be glorified in the twinkling of an eye and uh, connected with their soul and their spirit. That is the resurrection of the dead. And then, of course, later we see one angel picks up hell and uh, throws it forever into the lake of fire. And that's a right. separate event again. Right. Yeah. So the future hell, nobody's in it yet. No. No, like that, that's reserved for the very, very end. Now, the next question is, so once, once you go to hell, no, there, really, there isn't a second chance. No, no, no second chance. Uh, and uh, what about those who are saved, they go to heaven, uh, will they remember their loved ones that didn't make it? You know, I believe they will not. There's many scriptures that talk about the unsaved will be forgotten. Psalms 88, 12, Isaiah 26, 14. Deuteronomy 32, 26, Psalms 109, 15, and many other verses that talk about that the, those unsaved will be forgotten. So somehow God will erase them from our mind. So in heaven, you won't be in torment right. thinking about them suffering. Yeah. So it's a sad thing that your loved ones will be erased in a sense. Right. But I believe that's how God's going to have to handle that. Yeah, you know, delete you know, it from your mind. Well, in Revelations, it talks about, I think it's 21, talks about the fact that there'll be no sorrow. There'll be no tears in heaven. Um, everyone I've talked to who died and came back to life but went to heaven, they've all talked about the fact that once they died and they were in that presence, the memory of this world faded. And the bond that you would normally feel, like Ian McCormack and others that I've talked with, even Don Piper, you don't want to come back. Right. You know, this world becomes like a, a vague memory, a distant dream. In fact, one of the things that was interesting with Don when I sat and had dinner with him, he said, Rob, it only took 90 minutes in heaven to mess me up for life forever. He said, after experiencing heaven for just 90 minutes, ever since then it's been very hard to get used to living here. You see, when we get there, this world fades away. And the Bible says it fades away. There will be no sorrow, no pain, no right. tears. And so he erases any pain that right. would have been. But we will want to be with our families because remember every time Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and all, they said they went to the land of their fathers. Right. And David said when his son died, he goes, he cannot come to me, but I will go to, I will him. Go to him. So you will see your family. You will want to. Yeah. But those that didn't make it, God will have to handle it that way. Absolutely. Yep. Here's a good question. When you were in hell, did you see any children there? No. Uh, I did not. I, the screams I heard were adult sounding screams. Mm -hmm. You know how you could tell the difference in a child and, a, yeah. and a, an adult. Also, the people I saw through the flames were all adult size skeletons in this right. pit. So, but I had an understanding that there were no children there. Right. But more importantly, I believe it's what the scripture says. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And he said, unless you accept the kingdom of heaven as a little child, you'll not enter in. Right. And there's other scriptures. So I believe it's clear that the little children yeah. will go to hell. Absolutely. I don't know what the age of accountability is. Right. There's no age that is really defined in the Bible. Right. And probably that really varies from yeah, child. Probably different for different people. Right. Yeah. yeah, it varies. Absolutely. Are the demons in hell? You talked about demons in hell. Uh, one instance, pushing people back into the fire, et cetera, et cetera. You talked about demons that seemed as if they were chained to the wall. The demons themselves, are they in torment? I believe they're in partial torment. That's what Matthew Henry's commentary and Jameson Fawcett Brown and some others say that they're impartial. But here's the reason. 
Remember, Jesus went to cast out a devil in Matthew 8, 29, and the devil said to him, have you come to torment us before the time? Right. What time was he talking about? Revelation 20, 10, where Satan and his demons are cast into the lake of fire yes. at judgment day. Right. So uh, at that time, they're cast in the lake of fire and in full torment. But most of the commentaries believe that they are in partial torment, and I felt that they were in partial torment right, right. now. But, you know, they are cast down to the earth and in and Sheol. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15 says that Satan was cast down to Sheol mm -hmm. to the sides of the pit. And the word pit there is the word bower. It's the same word used in uh, Psalms 40, verse 2, where David says, You have brought me up out of a horrible pit. And many other verses mm -hmm. where the pit is the same pit that people are in. Yeah. So the Satan is in the, uh, the pit and he's also on the earth. Because Revelation right. 12, 4 says Satan was cast down to the earth. So he's on the earth and he's in hell. Mm -hmm. And so I believe he's in partial torment yeah. now, but later he'll be delivered up and Absolutely. cast in the lake of fire. And that's what I find in scriptures. They are tormentors. They suffer a degree of torment, but like we see in the end of the book of Revelation, they will be absolutely tormented. Right, yeah. exactly. Uh, did, uh, you talked about the maggots uh, this morning. The Bible talks about where the worm will not die. And the question is, did the worms go inside your body? No, I didn't experience it. And don't forget, I was there in a vision. So mm -hmm. I was there a little different than the people that are condemned there. Mm -hmm. But in viewing, I saw maggots all over the ground and crawling on people and all over. I don't know if they were inside them or just on them. Right. The scripture in Isaiah 14, 11 says, where the maggot will be spread under thee and will cover thee. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really say if they're in you, but it, they are under you and on top of you. At right. least we know that much. Right. Uh, it's hor horrific, no matter sure. what they are. They're... And you literally, you saw this, literally. I saw actual now, maggots. while you were there, did you see Satan himself? No, I did not. I saw many different demons of all different sizes and shapes. Everything twisted, grotesque, deformed, uh, reptilish in appearance, bumps mm -hmm. and scales all over their bodies and all, but I did not see Satan. Mm -hmm. I know we have authority over the demonic realm. That's, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, you know, they praise can't hurt God. us if we are living for God and serving Him. And that's why it's so important for us as Christians to live according to the Word of God. Because we do have an enemy. The devil hates people. Yeah. And he wants to get in, an inroad into your life somehow. Yeah. And people themselves open themselves up to the demonic realm mm -hmm. by the, the things they watch, the movies, mm -hmm. the people, the friends they keep. Video right. games. The video games. All kinds Music. of ways you can open Music. up yourself to yeah. the demonic Absolutely. realm and invite all these horrible mm -hmm. things upon yourself. Absolutely. That's why God wants us to live clean, live according to the Word yeah. of God, and we'll be safe. And, yeah. Protected. Drug use, hypnotism, right. alcoholism. You know, the more we lose control, the more we become an open vehicle where demons can traffic through us. Somebody wrote, why does 70 or 80 years of sin here on earth deserve an eternity in hell? Well, a couple uh, answers to that quickly. First of all, our souls are eternal and hell is eternal and God cannot take a person out of hell and place them into heaven because Revelation 21 27 says he'll let nothing into heaven that defiles or corrupts mm. and the way we are now would corrupt heaven see God's not going to let us into heaven to corrupt it just like we have the earth we've messed up the earth right. well he's not going to let us into heaven so he cannot have mercy on that person take them out and put them into heaven they would corrupt it we have to be given a new heart a new spirit that doesn't come from time spent in hell Time is a wrong premise to say, well, I paid off my sin. In other words, that would be works. Yeah. And we're saved by grace, not by works. Yeah. But also, it is deserving. Uh, and uh, Thomas Aquinas first made this point. Now, he was the greatest theologian of the medieval church in the 1200s. And he wrote in his book, Summa Theologia, he wrote that the greater the one sinned against, the graver the sin. In other say words, that again. the greater the one sinned against, the graver the sin. Mm -hmm. In other words, if I lie to you about my age, it would be wrong. Mm -hmm. But if I lie to the Supreme Court, it would be worse because of their position. Mm -hmm. If I punch my brother in the stomach, it would be wrong. Mm -hmm. But if I punch my mother in the stomach, it would be worse because mm -hmm. of her Dirty position. Dirty dog. Right? Right. Because of her position. Right. Well, God's infinitely greater in position, right. therefore deserving of eternal punishment. Also, God's infinitely greater in being. If I step on a bug and kill it, it's no big deal, even though it's life. But if I kill a cat or a dog, that would be much worse. 
But if I kill a human being, that will be even worse because mm -hmm. of the level. Well, God is infinitely greater in being. Right. So sinning against an infinitely greater being is deserving of eternal punishment. Greater consequences. See, does that make sense? Very, very good answer. Very, very good answer. Last question, last question. Uh, you often hear this. People say, didn't Jesus preach about love and acceptance? Why would there then be a hell? I thought the gospel was about God is love. Well, first of all, he didn't preach just love and acceptance. He pe preached repentance and obedience. The yeah. first word out of Jesus' mouth was in Matthew 4, 17, where he said, repent. That was the first word out of his mouth. Yep. And he said to the Mary Magdalene and the, the man at the pool of Bethesda and others, go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. So he didn't pull any punches. He told us not to live in sin. He told us to be obedient to the word of God. Yeah. So, but his message is a message of love because it's a message of warning. Absolutely. You know, what loving parent wouldn't warn their child not to play in a busy street? Mm -hmm. Well, God's given us a warning. He's telling us, hey, there really is a hell. You need to repent and live right in order to avoid it and, and uh, receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and then you'll end up in heaven. Absolutely. And he's a God of love, but he's also 100% just and 100% holy, just like he's 100% love. Right. He's all of that. Yeah. So he has to punish the crime, which yeah. he did on, G on his son, Jesus, on the cross. Right. See, so his justice demands that sin be paid for, but his love commands that he send his only son to die for us if we're willing to believe on his son our sin is washed our sin is atoned for his justice is is justified our sins are forgiven and the love of god right. gives us eternity justice demands judgment yeah and like my brother pointed out to me you know uh, God is not just, you know, one day he feels good and like, well, I think I'll, I'll have be more merciful this one. No, he's 100% just, just, so the crime always has to be punished. Always. But because he's 100% love, he didn't leave man in that predicament. Mm. So he said, I'll inflict the horrible punishment on myself. Amen. I'll take the punishment because he's 100% love. Yeah. So if we would trust in him, he takes the punishment for us. And then we just trust in him and he takes us out of hell and into, Amen. you know, uh, we, we don't have it, to go to hell. I think an important point here, though, is people struggle with is they're thinking, wow, this guy's in hell because he just made a mistake or he just didn't know or she just didn't know. They don't understand that God throughout every single person's life is desperately trying to reach us all throughout Absolutely. our lives. And Bill wrote about this in his third book, 23 Questions About Hell, that there's at least five ways in which God is trying to reach every single person. But we're the ones who are pushing away his mm -hmm. love and rejecting him throughout our lives. Yeah. So no one is in hell uh, by ignorance or accidentally or just because they made a mistake. I don't know if you want to right. share that. They knew some the way. Those, those Romans reasons. 1 said they knew the way. They re decided to reject the truth. Yeah. It's not that they didn't know. They knew and said, I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want anything to do with Jesus. I don't want this Bible stuff. They push him away. Yeah. So they're not there unjustly. They're there well, because God's they chose. Well, justice demands that he gives them just opportunities. Right. You know, he would be an unjust if he didn't make sure that through his Holy Spirit, through friends, through visitors, through signs, that he didn't give them opportunities. They must be given those opportunities, and he does that through his just nature. Every one of you here have had opportunities, and yet again tonight, you're having an opportunity to hear the gospel and to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Bill, we're coming to a close here, Annette. And uh, Bill, I'd like you to stand with me. And for one last moment, let's throw out the net. God so loves the world that he will do everything yet again tonight, knocking at the door to give people that opportunity. Stand with me right now. Would you address this congregation here? Yes. Would you all stand? You know, like Pastor said, God gives everyone countless opportunities to receive Him and repent. It's people that push Him away. 
But in Revelation 21, 8, it says, all unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. So if you say, Bill, I don't believe you and I don't believe the Bible. Well, he just told you all unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. You choose. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, your own words will condemn you. Yeah. It's our own words that send us to hell because people are saying, I don't believe the Bible. Mm -hmm. He's trying to get people's attention. He tries throughout their entire lives. Right gives them countless opportunities. Oh, no, no. You know, even the man in the remote jungle, he gives him an opportunity, yeah. number one, through creation. Yeah. He tries to get through because it's evident there's a designer. That's right. Design is all around us. It's obvious there's a designer that points to a creation, to yeah. God, that there's a God. He gives man dreams and visions. Job 33 says he even gives man dreams and visions to keep back his soul from the pit. Mm -hmm. So he will try to get through that man if he just is humble enough to reach out and say, there's a God, I want to know him. Yeah. God will get through to that man if he's humble enough. So if you're here today or tonight and you say, you know, Bill, I don't know if I've ever really repented. Because Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, unless a man repent, you shall all likewise perish. We all have to repent. What does that mean? Just simply to turn away from our sin. To say, you know, I need a savior and I'm willing to turn away from my sin. That's repentance. And in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Yeah. We have yeah. to believe in our own heart and confess him with our own mouth. But we have to do that. Because God loves us, he gives man the free will to choose. It's our choice. But God says in Revelation 20, 15, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. He has a book, and he's going to look to see if your name's in it. And it's up to you right now. You can know that your name would be written in his book. That's right. If you're not certain, you can know that right now. That's right. Please don't take a chance with your soul. Because one second after you die, it's too late. You will not get a second chance. Right now is your opportunity to receive Jesus and avoid this horrible place. If that's you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, Jesus. you would say, Bill, I don't know if my name's in his book. I'm not mm -hmm. certain, but I want it to be. Yeah. And I'm willing to repent. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. I don't care what you're raised with. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Yeah. If you want to get there, you have to receive him as your Lord and Savior. Yeah. With every head bowed, number I closed. If you would say, Bill, I don't know if my name's in his book, but I want it to be, and I'm willing to repent. God's coming to you guys. Every one of you here, this is so, so wonderful. We're going to lead you in prayer. Bill, will you lead them in prayer? Beyond. We're going to ask everyone to repeat this prayer, prayer after you, but especially everyone that's here right now, that's right. lead them in prayer. Just say this after me, okay? You ready? All right. Everybody can say, Dear God in heaven. Dear God, God in, in heaven, heaven. I know that I've sinned. I know that, that I've sinned. sinned. And I cannot save myself. And I cannot save, save myself. myself. But I believe you sent your son Jesus. I believe, I believe you sent your son Jesus. To die on a cross for me. To die on the cross for me. That he was crucified. That he was crucified. Died and was buried. Died and was buried. But he lives forevermore. He lives forevermore. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to forgive me. I repent. I repent. And I turn and follow you. And I turn and follow you. I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And it's by your shed blood. And it's by your shed blood. That I have forgiveness of sins. That I have forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For dying for me. For dying for me. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. I now confess. I now confess that I am a born again Christian. That I am a born again Christian. Going to heaven. Going to heaven. And I will serve you. And I will serve you all the days of my life. All the days of my life. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. To keep my eyes focused on you. To keep my eyes focused on you. Thank you for taking me to heaven. Thank you for taking me to heaven. 
In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. God. <laughs> and just two things. Two things I want to say, Pastor, to you guys real quickly. That's important. And number one is to get in the habit of reading the Bible every day. Now, this is not a religious exercise. It's not some r religious ritual. Yeah. The Bible is actually a manual for life. It's an instruction booklet. Yeah. Just like you read computer books and things, how to learn how to do things. It's a manual, and it teaches you how to live this life. It's a manual telling you how to live because there's an enemy that hates your guts and wants to deceive you and take your life. Yeah. But the Bible will teach you how yeah. to resist the devil, how to run him off. Yeah. It also teaches you how to obtain the blessings God has. That's right. He has blessings for each one of Absolutely. us. Absolutely. He has a great life for each one. A good job. He wants you to walk in health. He wants you to be a blessing to your families and, yeah. and your friends. But you have to learn it. Yeah. And you can't learn it without reading. Mm. So you've got to read the Word and it changes your thinking. You start thinking like God. See, now we think like humans, yeah. and, and we, we think messed up. But God thinks correctly, and our mind awesome. starts changing awesome. as we read the Word, That's and we right. get it in our heart. And we start yeah. seeing, okay, now yeah. I see how God thinks. Yeah. And you start living for That's God. Right.